We all struggle with feeling like there's not enough time in the day to be productive personally or professionally. We all struggle to make our time matter. It's time to take control. It's time to start investing in the corporation of you. At Athena, they've helped over 700 ambitious professionals achieve more by connecting them with best in class globally remote executive assistants. Athena executive assistants go beyond basic administration tasks. They help you make time matter through the art of delegation. They believe delegation is the superpower of all highly successful people. And your personal EA will help you get there. Your EA is a one on one long term partner to help you achieve your personal and professional goals. Take back your time. Join the waitlist at athenago.com. That's athenago.com. What information you provide and where you provide it and who provides the information are actually really critical questions to starting to design more of a consumer driven healthcare supply chain. From Offscript Media, I am Matthew Zachary, and this is Out of Patience. On the show today, Alan Balsh, CEO at the Patient Advocate Foundation and the National Patient Advocate Foundation. Yes, they sound the same. One has the word national before it, but I assure you they are two distinct parts of one incredibly necessary patient advocate organization. After we reconcile that Alan is one of the few people actually doing what he studied in college, Without channeling his inner political economist, we talk about the fundamental question, why do patient advocate groups even need to exist in the first place? Because if the system did what it's supposed to do, there wouldn't even be a need. But there is. Because when we say the words, the system, in quotes on the radio, it always implies an ominous, unmovable, intractable, unwieldy monolith. That's it. That's the sentence. Is the system Everything we think it is, a consumer supply chain funnel of supply-only jargon syllables that no one person ever desires to become a part of. Seriously, who can't wait to get chemo one day and fight with their insurance company? I wake up every Thursday and say that. Alan and I also go on to deconstruct the phrase, healthcare is a right. Is it? Is it really? Or is it a liberty or a freedom? Lots of banter about that one phrase. One last item, who, just who stands to benefit and or profit in some magical unicorn world where every cancer patient is guaranteed protections to ensure they get to determine their own outcomes without dealing with, buzzword alert, financial toxicity. Enjoy the show. Alan, thank you so much for coming out of patience. I have been a huge fan of yours for a very long time. And as someone who's actually doing what they studied in undergraduate, I congratulate you for maintaining that level of consistency as a political economist and CEO here at the Patient Advocate Foundation. And we will discuss the National Patient Advocate Foundation. Same thing, different words. How you doing? I'm doing well, Matt. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I, too have long been a fan of your work and excited about this new venture you're engaging in. So I look forward to listening to the podcast. So I was recruited, so to speak, back in 2004, five, six. People know my story. Some of my listeners can Google that. But I was asked a fundamental question, which is, how'd you like to be a cancer advocate? And I said, what the hell is an advocate? And it's a word, it's jargon to us. We use it all the time, but to the, to the newly initiated, right? What does that mean to you? Yeah, so I I think in the simplest form, it just means you're there to help. Um, And in some cases, that may even go so far as to mean to protect. Um, But in a more basic form, it's your job um, is to find ways to help people. Now, you've been at this a very long time. You've had a quite storied career in the Beltway. What prompted you to get into all this? Besides getting your degree and all this stuff? Um, actually, it was, I think the same is true for a lot of people. Um, there were personal reasons. So I myself did not have cancer, but um, my 
most of my family is involved in cancer in some way from a clinical perspective. Um, and then at a relatively young age, um, I ended up for a while taking care of my grandmother while she was dying a very painful death of colorectal, by colorectal cancer. And, and around the same time, I had my my uh, cousin, who, who was the flower girl in my wedding and uh, with whom I was very close, and her parents, um, she passed away. They, they both died within months of each other. Um, so that prompted me to really want to volunteer in the cancer community, and that was that was all she wrote. Once I started volunteering, uh, I was hooked on the passion and the drive of the community uh, and its focus uh, on so many different areas of healthcare, um, from prevention to research and everything in between. So, and I've worked across that spectrum over many years. So I've kind of seen and done it all. I feel like working in cancer patient advocacy is a hill to die on, but the hill keeps getting taller and taller and harder to die on because it's a moving target. Over the course of the last 20 or 30 years, there's been substantial improvements. I mean, one could argue some of the issues we face today are kind of like nice to have problems like fertility preservation when you kind Mm. of just died 30 years ago. But the fundamental issue of getting sick puts you into a store that you don't want to shop in and there's no one to greet you to tell you what to do. Let me know what you think about this statement. The system isn't broken. It's working as it was planned to do, and it's not meant to actually help people when they walk into it. Um, yeah. <laughs> the system wasn't designed to be a system. I think that's been said in many ways. But it, when that happens, it, it ends up being very um, segmented from a consumer perspective. Um, and so what you end up with is a a complex system that isn't really interconnected. So as a consumer, it seems disjointed. Um, it is a difficult experience to navigate because um, you have the insurance piece of it, you have the clinical piece of it, you have the pharmaceutical piece of it, you have the research piece of it. Um, and so, and they don't all work and speak together <laughs> by design because in it, we don't have a, a, a national healthcare system or a single payer system. So what we have is a series. It's it's almost like the school system in this country is very decentralized. And so, you know, a school system in the Midwest, uh, you know, may look very different um, from a school system in downtown uh, New York. Um, they fundamentally provide the same things, but they have different sets of problems and issues and different approaches to how they teach and the textbooks they use, etc. So that's you end up with when your system delivery is really at a local geopolitical scale um, or regional, then you do tend to have very different systems because they're each going to have a different technology system. They're each going to have a different um, electronic digital platform and you name it, they've got a different system. And so you spread that out across the country and then you have different insurance, you know, you have insurance at the state level across different states with different benefits packages um, Etc. So it, no one intend, it, It's not like someone sat down and intended to design the system the way it is. It just it is. It's tautological, I guess. It is what it is. Yeah. The reason I ask the question is because I always try to euphemize or anthropomorphize the fact that you know you are at the mercy of being told what to think, what your options are, and if you find a community. If you don't know what it's going to cost you, it's not like you're going to a restaurant and you have a menu because the, right. the the price fix is different than the steak, but the steak is cheaper at the restaurant across the street. And that's where you come in. That's where this right. idea of we're here, you and I agree on the word consumer as tantamount right. to patient. How do you protect people in this vulnerable Charlie Brown teacher moment where it's life and death in many cases? Yeah, I mean, well, it, and I should be fair from where I sit with the Patient Advocate Foundation, the National Patient Advocate Foundation, we sort of take responsibility for protecting them or guiding them with a subset of that universe of things that they will experience in those Charlie Brown moments. So we really focus on the financial aspect of it, the social determinant aspect of it, the things that they're experiencing in their in their real lives around housing and transportation and food and their insurance coverage. And those those things are very much part of their their ability to access and afford their clinical needs. So the two are interwoven, although sometimes we talk about them as somehow separate and distinct, one being sort of direct cost, if you will, and the other being indirect, but they're all direct 
experiences from the patient perspective. So that's where we come in as an organization uh, to help patients uh, understand uh, and navigate through those really basic problems that they'll experience as they're going through uh, receiving care in the world's most expensive and complicated healthcare system. I've used this sort of pop culture euphemism a million times when people ask me what you do. I'm fairly sure I'm kind of on the mark, but I always reference the opening scene of The Incredibles, where Bob Parr, who is Mr. Incredible, is like this uh, languishing in blue-collar insurance job death. <laughs> and he hates the paperwork, but this poor old lady comes in that says she can't afford this, and he kind of gives her all the loopholes. Don't give this to Allison. Don't go to the fourth one. Don't file this, and wink, wink, wink. And meanwhile... She gets all everything she needs, and then the boss fires him for giving her all the beans. To the extent that you are the loophole maker or the navigator or the Sherpa ninja of the system, is that is that accurate? Uh, well, it's only inaccurate because I don't have the privilege of doing that work. It is the work for which I'm responsible for helping to organize and strategize around. But really, that work is done by the the staff that we have that, that engage with patients and their families uh, in a one on one level. So that you're really describing our case managers and the, the amazing work they do every day. Um, it's just my privilege to be part of it. <laughs> um, so, yes, it, that's not a good description of me. Uh, however, it is a good description of the work that our team does every day. And it is precisely what you described in terms of you know, finding ways, because every, when you have an incredibly complex system, the number, number of barricades and loopholes and, and problems that you're going to face is, is, I don't want to say infinite because it's not, but it's fairly, <laughs> it's fairly broad. And so the number of solutions that you can bring to try to solve those myriad of problems are, are also pretty significant. So it is really trying to figure out, we, we think of it as sort of precision, to play on that word precision medicine, we think of it as precision navigation, right? You're really trying to figure out what does this patient need right now to help them what, or what are the three or four things that they really need and figuring out how to do that, whether it's getting them, you know, um, into Medicaid or whether it's helping them figure out an EOB, you know, whether they really, what they really owe on a series of bills or how do they get to their next chemotherapy appointment or how do they keep getting kicked out of their apartment or how do they pay their utility bill, et cetera. It really is a Sherpa guide in that sense. I love I, – it's, it's almost forensic in its intricacies. Can you give yes. me like one or two – like what are the most common things? So you get sick. You're there. You have no idea what it's going to cost you. How does that average patient know you exist and take advantage of the fact that you do exist? And then what are the – I would say in the word bubbles, like what are the most common things people are dealing with? Well, I'm going to answer that in the context of cancer because some of the answer to that is disease specific and then it gets complicated fast. So I'll stick, I'll answer your question thinking through the lens of a cancer experience. Um, generally speaking, uh, for cancer patients, um, the, it, the way people find us is what we, the two things we do primarily are case management and we provide financial assistance. So if you're in the healthcare system and you're trying to figure out how to pay for things, the cancer uh, healthcare system is actually pretty good about identifying those people that need financial help and then trying to tap into the various forms of financial assistance that are available to patients. So there's a, a host of financial navigators and social workers sort of embedded within the healthcare system. Now they're not equally distributed. Um, and, I, and so if you're living in a, if you're being seen in a smaller clinic or a rural clinic or some other uh, FQHC, you may not have access to the, those resources at the same level as if you're in, uh, I'm not going to say anybody by name, but if you're in a, a large, you know, cancer center or, you know, whether it's private or public. Um, so that's, you know, from, the, from a financial assistance perspective, um, the system is pretty good about finding those people and then um, guiding them to us. It, if your problems are more complicated around things like food or transportation or housing, um, it really depends. Um, a lot of patients find us because they call a, a 1-800 number of another nonprofit that is sort of the forward-facing organization for the disease they have, and they'll refer them to us almost like an emergency room for some crisis that they're having that is financial or um, material hardship in nature, and then we'll take it from there. 
Uh, similarly, if a patient is in a cancer care setting where the nurse or the PA or the social worker has identified a problem for that patient that is not that can't necessarily be assisted by the more traditional means of financial assistance, they will often also refer them to us. So we do by that nature, uh, just like an emergency room gets the most complicated patients than patients in pretty acute distress we sort of are the emergency room for financial and access barriers for cancer patients. Yeah, that's extraordinary because like we're talking about like a funnel system almost. Like you're entering this space and who do you know that knows who do you know that knows who do you yeah. know? Are you, I say you, like proverbially you, is, is the, <laughs> the, the organization itself, is that part of, I guess, standard navigation with nurses and social workers that are in the clinics per se? Like, is it like a known fact that you have to talk about this are you entitled to know what this is going to cost you and here are the resources before you even start anything? Um, no, unfortunately, you're not entitled to know. I do think increasingly um, various stakeholders in the system, including doctors and nurses and healthcare administrators and plans, and there's a lot of effort in the, the administration and others and patient advocacy groups are trying to create that that knowledge and that transparency. So pe consumers kind of know what they're buying and what the financial and other obligations are going to be associated with a course of care or different care and treatment options. That's a re it's, it's much easier said than done. And it can be done in actually a way that it, in the interest of transparency and consumer driven healthcare can be done, I think in ways that are actually not very helpful. Um, and, but it, it can be done in ways that I think are very helpful. And that's the challenge is how do you how do you actually give people that information set that they need to be good consumers and make good decisions uh, or at least informed decisions? It's not like voting with your dollars in sort of the traditional market sense of the word, but you're, you're definitely vote, you're definitely spending a lot of your own dollars in the in the course of your care, and you're literally putting your life on the line. So you're invested. Um, so I think bringing in that level, some of that consumer type of information and theory into the supply chain of healthcare is actually not only a good thing, it's actually, in my mind, it's obligatory. We, we should do it, we have to do it, but we have to do it in the right way. Back with our guest after the break. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice-monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. Picking up on where you just left off, I really want to focus on de-jargoning a couple of trigger words that are in, in this country, which is like rights, liberties, freedoms. And it's nice to say healthcare should be a right or a human right. Can you break this jargon Ooh. down for me and our listeners? Because I just, I can't make sense of any of it. Well, I'll do my best. I, I guess, yes, you're right. There's a, a, an off, a phrase often used is, you know, healthcare is a right and others say it's not a right because they sort of assume that that is a surrogate for saying healthcare is something that government has to provide. It's actually not true. You can say that something, when you say healthcare is a right, in my mind, that's just saying everybody deserves to have access to healthcare. There's lots of different ways that you could set up a political economy to distribute that resource. You just want to make sure that it's distributed <laughs> equitably uh, and that it's that people have access to it and that's hard to do 
because you know, mark, you can leave it to market forces, but market forces aren't exactly great at equally distributing a, a resource. You can have the government do it, but governments aren't exactly great at doing it efficiently. Uh, and sometimes they don't do it equitably either. So there's political risk either way. There's just this sense, this overarching sense in the U.S. Uh, in sort of market theory that, well, if it's the market doing this sort of, you know, it's no one's fault. It's sort of a... It's just the market. Whereas if the government's doing it, you have someone you can point to and you can, you know, they're human beings and actors and you can demonize them and, and you can point to their foibles uh, and the mistakes they made. Whereas, you know, the market seems less of, a, of an active conspirator, if you will. It's just right. a force that's out there. So it's, it, it, it's, it's just, well, that's just how the market goes. So I think that's the challenge is how do you, you know, once you say healthcare is something that everybody deserves to have and be able to afford, then how do you make that possible? What's the, the, the political and economic means by which you do that? So that leads me down the rabbit hole of another question. Is it possible to guarantee that a patient is made aware of all of their options and all of their challenges, obviously not before they happen, but we talked about, I'm not going to trigger the supply chain inside you, but the rite of passage <laughs> as you go through, quote unquote, the system, where do you deserve to know yeah. about different things where we're all missing the mark and getting people what they need to know in that moment? Well, let me be clear, first of all, to kind of tie it back to the last question. I do think that right to information and knowledge is important to have, whether you're in a system where healthcare is being delivered through a more sort of command and control government sort of means versus a sort of free market, you know, what you can afford kind of means. I still think in either of those cases, it doesn't change, I think, the need and the right that patients have to good information and decision-making power in either case. Um, so I don't have the answer to what that information set precisely needs to be. And I think that's, that's why I, that sort of goes to what I was saying earlier. We need to be very careful and design this properly. I think we know some of it, but we don't know all of it. You don't want to give people too much information because then they really can't. It's information overload, and it's hard as a consumer to make sense of it and know what's important to make it a decision. I do think there's a lot of effort underway in what I call pr what we call a patient preference science, um, where you can help um, narrow the field down uh, to an information set of what are some of the key factors that really are determinative of the outcome of a patient, both financially and for their health, for different types of care. And if you can create a means by which to help patients gain access to that information in a meaningful way at the right times, then that can help guide them in their decision making. At least they'll know what to expect, you know, even if maybe there's not a, a, a good choice. Right? <laughs> We're in the midst of an election, so people are always like, well, the lesser of two evils. I think oftentimes in a situation like cancer, you're kind of picking between treatment options that are often the lesser of a couple different evils, but you don't necessarily know exactly what you're getting all the time. So I do think... There is you know, where, what information you provide and where you provide it and who, you provi who provides the information are actually really critical questions to starting to design what I would consider more of a consumer-driven healthcare supply chain. We, we think of consumer-driven now as just asking, patient, you know, asking patients to pay more out of pocket. True consumerism actually gives you the opportunity, actually involves you in the decision-making process. So you're voting with your decision. And, and often in a true consumer economy, you're, you're actually paying dollars at that point of decision in a transaction way. It doesn't need to be that consumer driven where you're forking over your money before the, the go on the operating table. But you know, at the end of the day, consumerism is about the, the person who is being vested in the decision making authority around a transaction. And it doesn't mean that you're the only decision maker, but patients should be more empowered and more informed decision makers in the transactions of the delivery, the delivery of healthcare and the patient's consumption of healthcare. Well, it's it's like you you can't drive the car till you buy it, 
right? It's the opposite in consumer world. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You can like pay the surgeon in advance before your surgery and hope it comes right. out okay. It doesn't work that way. It's so antithetical. I always like to ask a question that I don't think has an answer, but it just triggers some kind of dogmatic, you know, turmoil in your synapses, which is who stands to profit the most, let's put our free market hat on, hmm. by guaranteeing these protections to people entering that store that they can't previously research before they buy it. Well, <laughs> did I break you? No, 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 no. <laughs> so if you think about, I guess it depends on how you defer, define the word profit. I would maybe, and I think you, oh, let's stick with the word benefit. Um, I actually think if you do it right, everybody benefits because, um, you know, every, the way I think about it is, the one thing everybody seems to agree on, at least conceptually, is they want to get the right care to the right patient at the right time, which is, if you boil that down, is very, is very much an individualistic type of approach to healthcare, which nicely kind of conforms with sort of the overarching theme of U.S. consumer society, which is all about personalizing things to you. If you turn on the TV now and you wait two minutes, you'll see at least one commercial that's all about how we're personalizing this to you. If that's the sort of the unifying theme, if you will, to healthcare delivery, then everybody has a vested interest and would benefit if you did that or you maximize the opportunity. So payers would benefit, um, employers would benefit because their their employees are getting the care that best suits their needs. That obviously the patient would. The clinician inherently wants to do that. I come from a family of clinicians. They they all are trying their best uh, to try to do the right thing by their patients. So I think there's actually that what's ironic is there's, I think there's this unifying desire within the healthcare system to try to, to have that as a norm from a normative perspective. It just, the system's never been designed uh, with that kind of goal in mind because it ends up being, well, the system's designed for the clinician to use it or the, you know, the system's designed for the administration, uh, the administers to use it or the technician to use it. Um, so the, the user experience is much more designed around the payer environment and the clinician environment and not really as much around the patient experience. Um, the general idea is that if the system is built right and if everybody agrees that it should be built around the patient as the, as the North Star, <laughs> sort of the central design principle, then all the incentives in the system would similarly align behind that goal. And therefore, the more everybody operated against that central theme of getting the right care to the right patient at the right time or putting the patient at the center of the, of the experience, then the incentives would fall in place. And when care was delivered that way, then everybody would profit, so to speak. That's a perfect way to segue into closing the show for the next few minutes on two magic words that are like sunlight to a vampire or, or uh. garlic to a vampire. Financial toxicity, a couple of syllables mm. that are highly triggerable to many different ears in the beltway, perhaps, or, yes. in, the, or in the system. We're going to use system with air quotes on the radio. There's a love-hate relationship with that term in our within our organization as well as I think others. I mean, in some ways, it's a, it's a, it's an incredibly useful term, and with you know incredible respect, uh, I think it was Yusuf Safar and uh, Amy Abernath that that coined the term uh, about seven years ago. Or so, but you know, it, it's useful in that it it at least brings into this conversation around side effects and around the impact of care. This idea that there is a, a side effect that is financial, that, that patients need to be aware of, that clinicians need to be aware of, that needs to be tracked, that needs to be monitored, that needs to be um, treated. So if you think about hair loss and neutropenia and other side effects where we've created a PRO environment to track those and manage those and intervene, and if you, if you use the word financial toxicity, introduce it into that environment of side effect management, and actually is quite useful from, you know, if you're trying to think about how do we incorporate, um, how do we bring this idea of financial burden into, you know, stop treating as sort of a negative externality or something that for which the, the healthcare system is not responsible. How do we bring it into the four walls of the clinic and create some accountability and responsibility around the financial journey of patients? I think financial toxicity is quite a useful way of orienting, they figure out how to orient and systematically address that problem of financial burden. So that's the upside. 
do you, do you want me to get to the downside? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is it self-evident? <laughs> yes. I think the downside is self-evident because again, it sort of reduces things to, you know, to sort of clinical problems and it sort of ignores, you know, financial toxicity. A, a lot of times people sort of equate to more, uh, more associated with perhaps the, uh, the out-of-pocket cost of care within the benefit design or even more uh, granularly associated with the, the drug costs um, out-of-pocket. You know, when we talk to patients and just ask them, what, what is it about your financial journey that's difficult for you, at least for cancer patients? Um, what are the financial pain points? Where do they occur? What's the amount? For cancer patients, it's all over the place. It's everything from their transportation to loss of work to their drug costs to their out-of-pocket costs for their surgery to hospitalizations to doctor visits to picking up stuff at the drugstore to their food. It's across the board depending on who you are and where you are in your, in your care journey, it can be any number of things. So um, we actually, I think you can use a couple different phrases somewhat interchangeably here, or like a little Venn diagram. Uh, you think of social determinants of health, you think of health disparities, you think of financial toxicity. Any number of those phrases can kind of be used to capture that domain of experiences that patients have that impact their access and affordability to the care that they're seeking. And so we, we really, we can't solve all the problems that a patient faces. And this goes back to my point about how do you create that more consumer driven experience and how do you give patients information that they really can use to help make decisions about what's best for them. Um, that's that universe that we need to, to cultivate and identify what are the six most important things for this particular patient that we know is going to, that we have a fairly high probability that we know they're going to experience these things and that they're going to impact their care and their care experience. And how do we, how do we either assuage those problems or minimize them or how do we plan for them if we can't avoid them? Um, so in that sense, you know, financial toxicity can be a useful word. Um, but I also think we shouldn't get too wedded to it because it's not a nice word for patients. It's not a patient-friendly word by any means, um, but neither is social determinants of health, right? Um, so I don't know what the right phrase is, um, but I think, uh, I think we could probably come up with some better terminology uh, if, you know, to the extent that we're trying to bring patients into these conversations around these issues, um, saying we're going to give you a financial toxicity screening now is, is not the kind of thing. I don't, that's not what people are doing, I don't think, but you can see why that you know, if you were to do it that way or say, here's your financial toxicity score, it, it's not, uh, um, it, it's a little crude, if you will, from a patient perspective. On the next episode of Less Syllables with Alan Balsh. No, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> you had me at Venn Diagram, bro. I want to thank you for coming on the show. Alan Balsh, my God, Sisyphusian hero to millions of cancer patients around the country, CEO at the Patient Advocate Foundation and the National Patient Advocate Foundation, gentleman, scholar, friend. Thank you. Oh, well, you're so kind, Matt. Thank you for having me on the show. And I really appreciate the thoughtful questions. That's all for today, folks. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. Out of Patience with Matthew Zachary is a product of Offscript Media. Our executive producer is Matthew Zachary. Our senior producers are Jen Horanjeff and Andrew McDowell. Darren Tun is our production intern. It is recorded, mixed, and edited by Matthew Zachary. Our theme music is by the Mike Van Allen Quintet and by Mara. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscript.com. Hit us up at contact at offscript.com to share comments, feedback, and make guest recommendations. For more information, visit offscript.com. <laughs>